Okay, looks like we're up and running. Excellent. Hopefully. There we go. We'll just give everyone a few minutes to arrive. Yeah, absolutely fine. Oh, we got some people saying hi in the chat. Hello, hi Ravinda. Hi, everybody. Hi, Tony. <laughs> Thanks so much for showing up so early in the term, everyone. I know probably everyone's exhausted. <laughs> Brilliant. We'll give everyone just like sort of a couple more minutes to, to arrive and then I'll do, do the introductions. Brilliant. I reckon we'll kick things off because we've got a few people here now. Um, so yeah, welcome everyone. Um, my name's Amelia. I'm part of the team at Seneca Learning. Um, I'm super happy to have everyone here today. Um, I'm just going to do a quick mic check to make sure you can both hear um, both me and Jade. So if you can hear me talking right now, can you pop something in the chat just to make sure that, that the sound's all working? Here's where I wait nervously to see if everyone's <laughs> everything's working. Brilliant, we're getting a few messages in. And then Jade, would you mind saying something so we can check everyone can hear you as well? Hello everybody, I hope you can hear me okay. Brilliant, we're getting loud and clear in, awesome. That's <laughs> all good to hear, fab. Um, so I'd love to, yeah, very happy to welcome everyone to our first free CPD of the new school year. Um, and I hope everyone's got, everyone's school year's got off to a really good start. Um, as some of you may know, you might have attended some of our CPDs before. Um, at Seneca, we host lots of these free CPDs throughout the year. Um, we've got a YouTube channel, um, which you can check out. We've got a whole catalogue of previous speakers. So if you'd like to, to check those out, please do feel free to. And we've also got a whole host of CPD courses on the Seneca site, if you'd like to check those out as well. Um, just a little bit of um, admin stuff. Obviously, we've got the chat here. Please, 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 I'd encourage you to use the chat as much as you'd like to. Um, we're going to have a whole Q&A section at the end of Jade's talk, and I'll be monitoring the chat throughout that to kind of save the questions so that we can ask them afterwards. Um, and nobody likes a Q&A with no cues, so please do make sure to get involved <laughs> as much as you can. Um, before I hand over to Jade, I'm just going to give a quick intro to Seneca. I know some of you will have used it, some of you maybe won't have, so I'm just going to steal two minutes of your time before the important stuff begins, um, just to explain a little bit of a little bit more about Seneca. So for those of you that don't know, um, Seneca is the UK's most popular kind of homework and revision app. We're used by over 6 million students and 350,000 teachers. Um, and that's the te at least one teacher in 97% of UK secondary schools, which is our, our most recent stat that we like to bring out. Um, and a little bit about our mission and kind of methodology. Uh, the key aim of Seneca is to give every child a fun, free education. Um, by using cognitive science to improve learning outcomes. So everything that we do is underpinned by the amazing work of our chief scientist, Flavia, who if you have signed up to Seneca, you've probably got lots of emails from. Um, and yeah, the aim is to use our adaptive technology to also save teachers time and gain valuable insights. Um, some of the kind of key benefits of the platform, we've got sort of 1,400 curriculum based courses um, on major exam boards, and that goes all the way up from primary to A level. Um, and we use multiple learning modes based on cognitive science to improve learning outcomes. Um, and for teachers, you can set automatic homeworks and assignments for your, for your students and then gain insights on that performance across the school. And one thing you may not know is we also have our parent platform as well, designed to help increase parent engagement um, through insights into how their child's been studying both independently and as part of homework set by the school. 
Um, and then just quickly on what a couple of things that we've got new. Some of you may have come across our new AI marked short answer exam questions on the site, which is something that we've been working on for a really long time here at Seneca, um, which are basically designed to give much more kind of detailed exam practice for students. So rather than sort of one or two words or being based on key phrases, these are using AI to so that students can write sort of a full one or two mark answer question um, mark question and then get an accurate mark back. So they're great for kind of that more detailed um, exam based feedback. And then the other thing is that I'm just going to give a little plug is our advanced analytics program, which is also new for this year. Um, so this is completely free for schools to sign up for um, and it includes kind of in-depth whole school reporting and MIS integration to save teacher time. So we set up all your classes and all your accounts um, and much more. So I'm going to pop an email to everyone who's who's been here today um, with a link to sign up if you'd like to sign up for that. But it's yeah, completely free. So I'd encourage you to. Um, brilliant. So without droning on too much more, um, I'll hand over to Jade now um, for the highlight of the show. Um, so I'll just I'll share your presentation, Jade. Thank you. Okay, hello everybody. Um, so my name is uh, Jade Pierce and I am an assistant head teacher at a high school in um, Stafford and um, I'm in charge of teaching and learning and CPD um, and I've put my contact details on the screen there. So I am um, Mrs Pierce or Pierce Mrs on, on Twitter and I've put my email address so if you want um, a copy of the presentation or to discuss anything further then um, feel free to, to contact me using either of those contact details. Um, I'm going to be speaking today about interleaving and I've called it um, interleaving what every teacher needs to know um, and that is because I am going to try and go through the what the research tells us about how we can introduce interleaving most effectively. So I'm sure lots of us will know um, what interleaving is and we might be using it in some ways in our teaching, but I'm really keen on looking in depth into the research and um, into the strategies that are advocated by cognitive science um, and kind of their active ingredients, the things that we need to do to make sure we implement them um, successfully. And I'm also going to try and give um, examples from different subjects. So I'm a high school teacher, like I said, so lots of the examples will be from high school, but hopefully you'll be able to think about um, if you are a primary school um, educator, how that might look in, in your setting. Um, and as Amelia said, please feel free to kind of ask questions and there'll, there'll be some time at the end to go through that. All right, let's get started. So first of all, I wanted to go through what it is interleaving. And I think this is super important because I think there's actually quite a lot of misconceptions around what interle interleaving is and um, how it can be implemented in our teaching. Um, so I'll just give you a minute to read the text on the screen. So as you can see, interleaving is the mixing up of learning material. So that might be examples or concepts or problems with other material, which is slightly different within one study session. So what I've tried to do there is try to clarify the kind of two biggest misconceptions about interleaving. The first is when we we have previously seen interleaving represented as um, any topics that are different being um, mixed together. And that's the graphic that you can see depicted on the screen there, which will say um, interleaving is where you do a bit of topic one and a bit of topic two and a bit of topic three, a bit of topic four, then you come back, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, that is true, but only if those, tro those topics are related or similar to one another. Um, so that's the first thing that's really important. And the second thing that's really important is that interleaving happens in one study session. So we often um, confuse interleaving and spacing. Spacing is where we leave a delay. So we might learn something and then revisit it later and then revisit it later. And um, where interleaving happens within one session. So you look at one example of a concept, other examples. So you don't look at, at that example again until later on, but it's still within one lesson, for example. So two really important things there. And then I really like the um, definition from Jonathan Firth's paper. Um, and I've got a references slide at the end, so I'll, I'll give you the title, etc. 
But he says each item is immediately followed and preceded by an example or concept of a different type rather than appearing in blocks of the same type. So it's this idea that if you're looking at examples of something, um, you don't do all of example A and then all of example B, all of example C. You do one of A, one of B, one of C, one of A, one of C, one of B, for example. Um, and then it is in contrast to blocking. So blocking is how we would maybe traditionally teach practice or do retrieval practice. That is where pupils study the same concept or solve the same type of problem repeatedly. So if you're learning how to um, add fractions in maths, blocking would be where you do adding fractions on its own, lots and lots of adding of fractions. And then later on, you might do lots and lots of taking away fractions. And then after that, you might do lots and lots of multiplying fractions, where interleaving would be mixing up. So doing um, an addition, a subtraction, a multiplication, and then keep going like that and changing and changing. Um, commonly cited examples of interleaving, I've just put there, it's identifying um, artists from their paintings. So maybe looking at the work of, I don't know, two or three different artists and you have to identify uh, the artist from their painting or the type of art, um, the genre of art, I suppose, and, and interleaving would be mixing those up. And then again, mass problems like we've spoken about. So hopefully that's kind of clarified what I mean when I talk about um, interleaving that mixing up of slightly different topics within one study session. OK, so if you follow me on Twitter or if you've ever attended um, a session that I've done, you'll know that I'm super passionate about evidence informed practice. And I also think it's really important that when we talk about evidence informed practice, we're specific about the research that we're referring to. So I'm sure you'll have heard of the interleaving effect. That is basically that interleaving practice and interleaving content leads to improved learning compared to blocking. Um, so in the same way that the testing effect shows that testing is effective for learning, the interleaving effect shows that interleaving is effective for learning. Um, and that has been shown to be true in lots and lots and lots of different educational studies. Again, I've got some references at the end, but it's also been shown to be um, true for lots of different types of learning. Definitely the main research, the vast majority of research on interleaving looks at um, mathematical problems, solving mathematical problems. And there's um, lots of studies that show that interleave practice improves later test scores in maths. However, there's also research that has used interleaving with visual, visual material, sorry. So experiments have shown interleaving to be effective for learning to distinguish between types of paintings, like I've always referred to, maybe different types of birds, different types of trees. So where you've got to look at a visual, an image, a picture, for example, and you've got to be able to categorise that, um, interleaving has been shown to be uh, really successful for, for that type of learning. But then really interestingly, we've also got um, more skills based learning, which uh, interleaving has been shown to be effective for. So music, where interleave practice of different performances was more effective than blocked practice. So if we're trying to, to um, learn different um, pieces of music on, on our musical instrument, interleaving the practice of those has been shown to be more beneficial. Same for motor skills. So we're thinking our kind of sport and PE here, maybe interleaving different types of golf swing has been shown to be more effective than just doing one type of golf swing and then um, another type of golf swing. Foreign language learning, where interleaving um, has been shown to improve the retention of foreign vocabulary if it's interleaved. So where we're not just focusing on uh, maybe one um, tenth of the language or uh, doing lots of practice over a small number of words, but actually where we interleave that and then finally, scientific concepts. So that is really important, actually, because scientific concepts are very similar to um, the type of thing that we would want our pupils to learn in lots of different subjects. You know, they may be more complex, etc. So a huge amount of research that um, supports interleaving and the interleaving effect and shows that um, it can be across a variety of subjects or a variety of, of types of material. Now, I am going to refer here to the recent EEF review and um, their review of cognitive science approaches in the classroom. Interleaving was included in that uh, and the report showed that there is 
research that has been done actual, actually in real classrooms with real pupils by real teachers uh, with real subject material rather than just, than just in labs or with university um, graduates, for example. Uh, and again, it said that the similar to what I just said, the vast majority of the research that's been done in classrooms has, it, for interleaving has been done around maths. And um, there is evidence to suggest that interleaving is effective, but that more research has got to be done in the classroom. So uh, we do want to be honest about how much evidence there is that supports these different techniques. Um, and that's what the EEF uh, review found. OK, so lots of research to, to, to support us um, in this strategy. Why is interleaving effective? And understanding why interleaving is effective, I think, is really important for understanding how it should then be implemented. So um, I'm going to refer to three reasons. The first is that interleaving creates a desirable difficulty. Um, if you haven't heard of that phrase, it was uh, coined by the Bjorks um, in their paper, making things harder on yourself, but in a good way. And they basically explained that if we make learning slightly more difficult, from spacing, for example, or through retrieval practice or through interleaving, because that increases the cognitive effort and the cognitive processing that pupils then have to do when they learn or when they complete activities, um, that improves learning. It forces the brain to work harder, improving the strength of our long, of our long term memory. And because interleaving, where we're looking at different examples or how to solve different problems is more difficult than doing it as a block. And um, that can be said to be a, desir a desirable difficulty and therefore to improve learning. The second and probably the most um, interesting to me reason why interleaving is said to be effective is the discrimination contrast hypothesis. This says that interleaving makes it easier for learners to compare and contrast items. And so it helps them to notice differences between them, especially if those differences are quite subtle. And this improves their ability to do this in the future. Now, this is really important because it basically relates back to my first point that interleaving is actually the mixing up of similar topics and more similar to uh, concepts. Because if we are mixing up things that actually have no similarities are just different questions, one question on topic A, one question on topic B, topic D, and, and none of those things are related, we, we don't actually benefit from the discrimination contrast hypothesis. So that shows us that to benefit from interleaving, the things that we are interleaving have to be similar, easily confused, etc. And actually, this is also supported by research, which has shown that if we interleave things that aren't related, that is the research that has shown that interleaving isn't effective. And um, so it's probably not that it's not effective. It's that it's not effective if we aren't interleaving those similar things that people tend to confuse. And then finally, the, the um, attention attenuation hypothesis says that learners tend to pay more attention to interleaved items. Um, there's no mind wandering or declining attention that occurs when we do repeated examples. And we can probably think of examples of that um, in maths, for example, where students might have done lots of black, blocked practice on how to uh, solve a certain problem. And um, they, they, may, they might work really hard and pay lots of attention and concentrate really fully for the first three or four. And if you're asking, asking them to do any more than that, they don't pay as much attention and they don't uh, work as hard to complete those problems. Because interleaving is one type of problem or one example, and then a different one and then a different one, that mind wandering where we're actually not working hard and not really processing things doesn't happen. So that's why interleaving is effective. And like I've said, I really want to concentrate on how, therefore, if we know these things, how can we implement interleaving most effectively? So I've tried to look at what might make effective interleaving and then what might be ineffective interleaving. So I'll go through the ineffective list, first of all, so ineffective interleaving might be if we try to interleave unrelated subjects or topics. So um, if we are, are just choosing random topics that aren't related and putting questions together in a quiz, that would be ineffective interleaving because we're not going to benefit from that um, discrimination contrast hypothesis. If the items are too similar, research has shown that, that interleaving can be less effective because it's too difficult for people to notice the differences. Now, we could overcome that by pointing it out to pupils, but it might be that blocked practice might be more effective there. Also, if we have too many different examples. So if you're trying to interleave 
10 types of mathematical problems or 10 type, types of um, artist paintings. Uh, there's so many that people's working memories can't hold the differences, basically. So it makes it it makes it more difficult to um, realise the differences and, and learn from that. Also, interleaving is um, less effective if we're looking at really large concepts or texts. If there's something that maybe takes you 15 minutes to look at or half an hour or a whole lesson, then you try to do something else. Because you're not comparing them directly, you don't really benefit from that interleaving. And similarly, if there's too much of a delay between the examples kind of linked to that, I suppose. And um, what we want is um, examples that we can look at quite quickly next to each other. So how can interleaving be most effective then? Well, first of all, we want to use similar concept with more obvious differences. And I'll give you lots of examples of this in a minute. We want to use concepts that pupils tend to confuse. It really highlights the differences between them and avoids that kind of misconception and confusion taking place. We want to use a small number of examples or concepts and small or brief concepts so that we haven't got really big things that we're trying to compare and contrast. We want to do it in one study session, as I said at the start. And really interestingly, actually, when I've done research on, on um, interleaving, it might be that if the material is really complex, we want to start with block, looking at blocked teaching and blocked practice and then move to interleave practice over time. Um, so that's obviously really dependent on your pupils, their prior knowledge, um, et cetera. But if you think actually this is something that's going to be really difficult for them to understand or be able to do, it might be better to start off with block practice before moving to interleaved practice. And again, I'll give some examples of that. So I hope that kind of makes it clear the active ingredient ingredients of um, interleaving. Um, and I just wanted to give some examples of, of things that I think are often cited as interleaving, but would therefore come under that banner of maybe not using interleaving as effectively as we could. So like I've discussed, questions on unrelated topics. Uh, but also we often um, see study guides which will encourage pupils to do a little bit of geography and then a little bit of history and then a little bit of science and, and say that that is interleave study but actually we wouldn't view that as interleave study because it's no, it's not those similar concepts and then trying to interleave our curriculum again maybe won't count so if you think that we might um, in English teach one lesson on Romeo and Juliet and then another lesson on poetry and then another lesson on something else and then come back to Romeo and Juliet, then that probably wouldn't be considered as effective um, interleaving because of the time delay, because they're not related concepts, etc. OK, so we know. Um, the conditions under which interleaving is most effective and then I just wanted to talk about what might that actually look like in our teaching then when can we actually use it so we might use um, interleaving when we actually introduce new content so instead of blocking our teaching and um, looking at all of, of one concept and all of another we might interleave it when we initially introduce that information to pupils we might use it when we practice either new new practice or space practice and we might use it in retrieval. And I wanted to highlight this recent paper, which is actually really interesting, which shows that if we interleave retrieval practice, um, that leads to better long term memory than non interleaved retrieval practice. This was just in science learning. But again, we can see how that might apply across lots of different subjects. Um, OK. So I'm going to give you some examples now, and these are examples that I've taken from um, teachers across my school in lots of different subjects. Some of them are uh, examples of how interleaving might look when we teach new, new material, or when we're asking students to practice, or when we're doing retrieval practice. So this is an example from geography, um, where they have to look at um, glaciers, ice sheets, and ice fields. And they're things because they look quite similar that students often get confused. So instead of learning all about glaciers and then all about ice sheets and then all about ice fields, 
um, interleaving would mean that you look at those things together. So you look at a glacier and an ice sheet and an ice field and the differences between them. And then you're asking students straight away to look at examples of those three things together and to say, right, this is um, a glacier, this is an ice sheet and this is an ice field. So not looking at them in, in blocks, but looking at them interleaved, looking at them together when you initially teach that material. Second example is similar and it's from science where students have to learn about different types of cells and they have to look at animal cells, plant cells, bacteria cells. Blocked practice would be where you'd learn all about animal cells and then you'd learn all about plant cells and then you'd learn all about bacteria cells, for example. Interleave practice is when you um, look at them together. So you look at um, plant, animal and bacteria and you're learning to say right this is a plant cell and I know that because this one's an animal cell, this one's um, a bacteria cell um, and you might look at the parts of the cells like the nucleus for example or at all of them at the same time so you don't learn about well, this is a bacteria cell and this is the nucleus and this is a cytoplasm etc and then do the same for animal and then do the same for plant you look at all of them interleaved um, at the same time This is another example in English and, and probably more, more to our lower school or for our primary school. When we are learning about different types of sentences, um, and we might look at statements, questions, exclamations and commands. Interleaving would be looking at all of those different types of sentences together in turn. So you might look at an example of a statement, then an example of a question, then an exclamation, then a command, and then go back to question, back to statements, etc. So we're not learning all about statements and how they should be used and then all about questions and then all about commands. We're mixing those up. Okay, so that's examples of how we might use interleaving when we're teaching new content. And then the other thing that we might do is use interleaved practice. So this might be where you've actually taught in a blocked manner, but then you're encouraging pupils to um, rehearse, to practice in an interleaved fashion. So this is an example from my maths department, and this is all about coordinates. And we've got four different skills that pupils might have to uh, demonstrate or four different types of problems that they might have to be able to solve when they're looking at coordinates. We've got find the midpoint, find the gradient, find the straight line equation, and find the length of the line connecting the two points. Block practice would be doing lots of examples of finding the midpoint and then lots of examples of finding the gradient, lots of examples of finding the straight line. Where with interleaving, we mix those up. So we want them to do an example of finding the midpoint, then an example of finding the gradient, then an example of a straight line. And then we might go back after these four examples to do some more of, of each type again. Um, and really interestingly, I think the reason that interleaving is so successful in maths and the reason that lots of the research is about maths is because research has shown us that when we interleave like this, it makes pupils choose the right method essentially and to realize right i know it's coordinates but this is how i find the midpoint and this is how i find the gradient and to not confuse those two things um so interview practice in maths um, i would highly recommend and then i've just put another example here and again this is from our maths department um and it's actually from an external source so i will cite this properly in my references but we have got um, finding the length of A to B, finding the size of the angle, finding the perimeter. So it's similar skills and similar questions, but we're not doing lots of one and lots of the other. We're asking pupils to um, do all of them, I suppose, in one practice. Okay, more interleave practice now, but this time um, a PE example. So this is um, where we are trying to get people to practice types of shots that they can do in badminton. And if we were doing block practice, we might do um, lots of practice of doing a smash shot, for example, and then lots of practice of doing a drop shot. Lots of people are doing lots of practice, sorry, of doing a net drop. Um, and then um, interleave practice would be, right, I want you to practice one smash, one drop, one net drop, and um, one defensive clear, so that, and then going back to a smash, going back to a net drop, so that we are um, practicing different shots along the way. And um, I'm really interesting to see that it can be applied to those kind of practical skills as well as just the, the, the uh, knowledge that, that we want our students to learn. 
Um, interlude practice and science here. So this is from my science department and um, this is when students have to be able to identify types of um, rock and, um, and types and basically we have to look at intrusive or extrusive um, types and the, the crystals are different essentially. You can probably tell that I'm not a scientist, but the crystals are different. And so um, block practice would be looking at lots of intrusive and then lots of extrusive, where if you interleave your practice, you might look at, well, the first two are um, intrusive, the, set, the third one is extrusive, et cetera. So you, you mix those up and you're encouraging to pupils to think about why is this intrusive? Why is this one extrusive? What are the differences between them? And I think we can see there how that um, interleaving, that mixing does really help pupils to cement their understanding of the differences so that they can do that kind of classification. Um, and then this is one from business studies, this is actually my subject. We have to do lots of calculations, as I know we have to do in, in most of our qualifications nowadays. Um, and when we are learning to calculate different types of ratio, blocked practice would be doing lots of calculations of the current ratio. It's just um, how we analyze accounts. So the, the calculations that we do when we're looking at different businesses accounts. So block practice will be doing lots of the current ratio and then doing lots of the asset test and then doing lots of the gross profit margin. Where now when we interview practice, we would do a current ratio, then an asset test, then a gross profit margin, et cetera. And then we do that again. And so you're still doing the same amount of practice. You're just not doing big blocks of one and then big blocks of another. Okay. Um, interleaving is also really popular in um, languages, and this is actually from a colleague of mine, a Twitter colleague of mine. This is from Sylvia Barstow, who's Frau Barstow, I think, on, on Twitter, and she's absolutely brilliant and has a great languages blog, so I'd thor thoroughly recommend you following her. Um, and when she speaks about interleaving in maths, she speaks about it being really beneficial for learning tenses. So here we've got a range of tenses in the hobbies topic. So we're not going to look at, right, we're going to do all of the future tense and then all of the past tense, etc. We're going to mix that up. So um, I visited the museum being in the past tense and she did judo being the past tense. Um, but at the weekend, I will do homework. On Saturday, I will skateboard. Um, so that we're mixing those tenses up rather than doing lots of practice of one and then lots of practice of another. The, the other use, and I haven't got an example on the screen, but the other use that's really popular in languages is the mixing up of vocabulary. So we don't do lots of practice of, of um, a small number of words or even one word and how we would use that. We mix that up, we interleave that. OK, so that's kind of practice and lessons. So we've gone through how we might use um, interleaving when we first teach new content. Then we've gone through how we might use interleaving when we practice and we get students to rehearse, whether that's at the time of learning or spaced after a delay. But like I said, there's lots of research which shows that interleave retrieval practice is um, really effective as well. So um, this is where we are asking pupils to revisit their prior learning from memory, using their long term memory to answer questions or complete tasks, etc., to retrieve that information. Um, and this is a technique that we use a lot in, in my school. We do lots of retrieval practice and we do lots of quizzes. And instead of doing a quiz on one topic and then a quiz on another topic, we try to identify those topics that we know pupils confuse. And then part of our retrieval practice strategy is to do retrieval practice of them at the same time. So um, like I said, business studies is my subject and pupils always confuse exchange rates and interest rates because uh, they're both about money essentially and they both got the word rates in and so when we actually teach them separately um, but then when we come to, uh, to do our retrieval practice, we mix them together. So you can see what are exchange rates, what are, what are interest rates? How is the interest rate calculated? How do we do calculations in exchange rates? What's the impact of interest rates? What's the impact of exchange rates? Um, and, and we found that that really helps pupils to cement, actually, this is interest rates and this is exchange rates. And they're not the, the same things. And, and we don't end up with anywhere near as much as, of confusion as, as we have in the past. Um, so that kind of really easy method, I think, of interleaving of um, maybe topics that you've taught in the past that you know students will confuse, just put them together in, in a quiz. Okay, interleave retrieval in maths. 
So we can see here that it follows the same pattern as the practice in maths, where um, when we look at rounding, for example, we're not just doing hot lots and lots of whole numbers. Um, I'm not sure how big this is on your screen, so apologies if it's small, but this is the kind of purple arrow here with rounding. So instead of just doing rounding to whole numbers, we've got rounding to whole numbers, rounding to two decimal places, rounding to three decimal places. Um, so we are looking within each topic at doing interleaving. But then also here, the maths department mix different topics. So you can see integers, rounding, uh, bid mass and place value. Now, I wanted to bring this example um, because these big topics aren't necessarily things that people's confused. The little things in between might be, but these won't be. Uh, and the reason that's still considered effective is because there is research which suggests that in maths, and it's only in maths really, interleaving of any type, um, not necessarily just of similar topics, is beneficial. So we can move from one topic to an unrelated topic in maths, and that would still be considered or, or has been shown to be effective, um, especially when I think we're um, having problems to solve, which bring in lots of different parts of, of the syllabus or lots of different parts of learning, really effective for our, our maths kind of long term retention. So a little bit of a, di a different one there for maths that I just wanted to highlight to you. Um, some more examples of interleave retrieval then. This is our science department um, and they do their retrieval practice here on cells and they're looking at the functions of the different types of the cell. Um, so again, they're not looking at these things in isolation. They're looking at all of them together because it's something that they know people get confused. They confuse what the nucleus does compared to the cytoplasm compared to the cell me membrane. So you're going to look at all of those things together. And then a bit of a wider one for English, we might want to interleave kind of bigger topics, I suppose, um, to really draw on our pupils' prior knowledge. So we're looking here at the, how the role of women is explored, but we might do Romeo and Juliet and um, Of Mice and Men and um, a poem, My Last Duchess, in one go, um, so that people can really compare and contrast what different authors do and how they do it. So kind of an example of a wider um, comparison there. OK, so that kind of brings me to the end of my subject specific examples. I hope I haven't gone through that too quickly. I just wanted to take the time now to kind of summarise um, what I've been trying to show you. What does every teacher need to know about interleaving? So the first is that we need to mix up similar concepts and those that pupils tend to confuse. So um, like I've said, not random topics, not just different subjects. It's really about identifying those things that we know are similar and either teaching those in an inter interleave fashion, practicing them in an interleave fashion or retrieving them in an interleave, interleave fashion. Trying to make it really clear in my second point that it's in one study session, it's important that they happen really close together in time. And like I've said, it can be used when teaching new content. It can be used in practice, whether that be after initial learning or space practice after a delay. And it can be used in retrieval practice. And then just a little note there that if there is that really complex material that we know students are going to struggle with, it might be better that we teach the initial content using blocked practice, but that we um, use interleaving after that block practice. So in maths, you might do all of one type of problem first and then lots of the second type of problem, but then you start mixing that in um, as much as you possibly can. Um, OK, what I wanted to have a look at now was just to give you a bit of an opportunity to reflect. We know that it can be really great when we attend a CPD session and hopefully you've got some interesting um, information from that and some, some useful information from that. But then we go back to our kind of busy, crazy lives and we don't tend to um, always implement things that we have thought previously were a good idea. So this is a little bit of time now for you to plan how you might use interleaving in your teaching um, and the, the two steps I suggest you take are identifying the topics which first of all would benefit from interleaving so it's not going to be everything because you've got to have something which is similar or, or that people tend to confuse and then think about how would interleaving be best used within that topic would it be best to do it in initial teaching would it be best to 
teaching blocks and then do some practice or is it something that you're just going to do later on um, in retrieval practice so I think um, Amelia if it's okay with you what I'll do is give some time for questions now and then if we've got time at the end we can kind of go through this with people yeah that would be super I think um, it seems like most people have just really very much enjoyed all the examples is most of the feedback we've got so far yeah, so I reckon if we let people go have a go at thinking about their own practice and maybe sharing their ideas in in the chat so that people from yeah. the same subject can maybe have a bit of a discussion and then yeah, we can amazing. do a few questions after brill um, so i know that i've gone through that quite quickly so if you have got any questions or if you want to clar clarify anything please feel free to put that in the chat and amelia will come back to me with those um if we have a bit of time now then for you to have a think about what interleaving might look like in your subject and then yeah really like the idea of if we put those in the chat and then if we've got history teachers they can kind of um, see what other history teachers might think or science teachers etc so I'm going to give you a few minutes now everybody just to do a bit of reflection on your own and then um, when you're ready or if you have got any ideas of how it might be useful in your subject if you could put that into the chat that would be great. Hi Tony. Yeah, it will be it will be available to go back over um, offline later. So we'll we'll send you an email after after the event with the link to to watch it again if you'd like to see it see it back. It's a great one from Wendy that um, she says that she's a science teacher and one example that comes to mind is doing cross-discipline work on concentration, so solutions with diffusion of osmosis and active transport in biology. Yeah, I love that because it's not just looking at um, what students might confuse within biology or within chemistry, but actually it's looking at that uh, across topic. So really like that, Wendy. Thank you so much. And um, we've got a similar one from from Miss Williams as well on on bonding. So is that like covalent co co bonding and the others? It's been a while since I did any <laughs> chemistry, but <laughs> the different types of bonds. Yeah, really good. I think the gist there is that we will know the topics that pupils tend to struggle with and tend to confuse, but we'll also know when there are similarities between things, but we still teach them kind of separately. Um, and then we have to go back and explain to pupils, actually, this isn't the same as this or, or later we think, oh, they've answered that question. They've talked about the wrong thing. They've got confused. So interleaving would help, hopefully, try to um, prevent that from happening. Ah, yes. It's ionic, ionic covalent and metallic. There we go. <laughs> A good refresh. I'm not like I knew all along. <laughs> 
Me too. We've got another cross-discipline one from, from Deepti, which is biology and PE for working in muscles. Brill. Yeah, I think that's a really nice point, actually. There'll be, it might be something that we do need to discuss across disciplines. Um, and I read a really good example, actually, that was referring to um, breathing and respiration, and that we often use those words interchangeably, but actually they're completely different things. Um, and so you can see another link between kind of science and PE there, I guess. <clears throat> so that would be a nice, a nice use of interleaving as well. Got a couple for history coming up and things like that as well. So we've got Mary, Mary the First, and Mary Queen of Scots. I can understand definitely how those could get confused. Yeah, um, I'm sure one. that happens all the time in history and causes of different wars. And and I can imagine that kind of thing gets gets confused a lot. Definitely, English language, looking at different types of texts, um, and for teaching topics related to grammar and punctuation. Definitely, I know I could have done with some work on semicolons when I was at school. That was how they were different to normal colons. I think I still get that confused in my work sometimes. Yeah, and um, Jonathan Thirst, whose paper I I quoted at the start, he's done a really nice blog actually on interleaving across the curriculum in different subjects, and he mentions grammatical structures in English um, because it, it is something that students get confused and they use the wrong terminology or they use it in the incorrect way I know my daughter she's only nine and she um used to confuse commas and apostrophes and which one was which because they're both curly aren't they and one's at the top and one's at the bottom so you can see how um interleaving the use of um different types of punctuation for example would would be beneficial as well Respiration, another one that's coming up a bit. History of the atom. We've got some really good science examples coming up. Yeah, I think I can. You can see how it works in science because there's so much terminology, um, and so many similar concepts. So I can really imagine how how it would work in science really well. It's definitely one way you've got to get your um, curriculum out. You've got to get your scheme of work out and start highlighting things that you think you can um, interleave. Definitely a starting point, I think. Definitely. Out of interest, and actually, what do you think would be the hardest? Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, you go for it. You go for it. It's fine. I was just going to say, what do you think would be the hardest subject to teach um, using interleaving? Um, well, I can say I'm not sure of the hardest because I don't um, teach them all. But I can say in terms of research, I think the least effective use of interleaving has been seen in history for example um, and, I, and I really like the kind of Mary Queen of different Marys different Henrys I can see how that would work and, and coming back to to think to, to things that people's confused names etc um, but I think that's because in history there's maybe not that many uh, really similar concepts you know time periods are very different um, events are very different so um, and, and they're also quite big themes, aren't they? We don't tend to look at little isolated things. Um, so I can still imagine it working in terms of terminology. I know when I've observed like year seven history in my school, they might look at um, castles and the different parts of the castles and how they um, were used to defend. That, that I think would work quite well. Um, but it, because it's quite big chunks and big topics, I think maybe that's why it's, it's not used as much. That makes a lot of sense. And then just for my own interest more than anything else, with um, maths in particular, I was wondering if there's any kind of hypothesis as to why maths works so well with interleaving quite varied topics, whereas it doesn't work quite so well for other subjects. Um, I think that, it, and I'm not a mathematician, but from what I've read, I think it's because part of the, and, and math teachers will know this, part of the issue in maths is pupils being sure of the solution that they need to use. And that's not always just within topics. It's big, big topics as well. So I think that's why I think it's because any interleaving encourages pupils to select the right methodology but also I think it's because those kind of big problem solving tasks and questions that we want our pupils to aim towards in maths do integrate lots of different parts of the maths specification so you don't just have to know probability you have to know probability and something else and something else and something else um, so I think that's probably why. 
Mm, but I'm not a mathematician. So if you are a mathematician <laughs> and you you've got a better better answer to that, then you can you can enlighten us. But I, I think that's the, they're probably the two reasons. Brilliant. Amy has made a very good point in the chat about the fact that actually examiners interlink concepts all the time, and actually using the key command words of of compare is really good practice to get students into. Yeah, and our science department use um, Venn diagrams really nicely as well when they're trying to compare and contrast in interleaving. Um, so like plant cells, animal, animal cells, um, obviously in a Venn diagram. So that can be a really nice way to, um, to interleave without it just kind of being a list of questions or anything like that. Definitely. Has anyone else got any questions for, for Jade on interleaving? If they want to pop them in the chat, we've still got sort of five, ten minutes if anyone's got any. Um, but in the meantime, a good history example from Wendy as well, I'll just pop it on the screen now, um, is like comparisons of, of modern day dictators and rise to power. So using, again, this, this that idea, it's similar to English, like bigger themes and tracking them across different periods in time. Yeah. Um, and I can see that in English because it's like, I suppose it's like the English example I shared that you, we, we would look at the role of women, but in lots of different um, literature, we'd look at similar themes in, in history in lots of different time periods. I'm really making that obvious and saying, right, this is what we already know about um, dictators because we've studied this period of time and this person. And how does that compare and contrast to what we we're now looking at? Definitely. It looks like everyone seems happy with no questions. Yeah. Um, I'll give it a few more minutes, uh, just a few more seconds. So if you've got any, pop them in the chat now. Um, but if not, we'll let everyone get on with their, their Thursday evening, I think. Well, hopefully that means everyone's happy with everything. Definitely, lots of positive, lots of positive in the chat. So yeah, in that case, if we've got no more questions, um, I'd like to say a super huge thank you to Jade for an amazing presentation. I learned loads about interleaving. Um, that was, so it was, yeah, really, really super. Um, and for everyone who attended, thank you so much for, for turning up on a Thursday evening, particularly so early in the school year. Um, and I'll send an email after, after this to give you links to some things on Seneca that would be helpful and also um, to link to this presentation if you want to go back to it um, after a later time or share it with any of your colleagues. Thank you so much, everybody. I do realise that it's only the second week and it probably feels like about the, the second month at least. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for attending and I hope you found that useful. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your evening.